Imagine if you lived in a world where you were constantly under surveillance, a world where every aspect of your life was controlled by a single entity, where you are subjected to relentless propaganda, with you existing as one insignificant character in an elaborate script. This is the chilling vision of reality that Peter Weir put forward in his masterpiece, The Truman Show. Sound familiar? Well, The Truman Show's story echoes nearly every aspect of our modern society today. So let's take a deep dive into the story of The Truman Show to understand how you're being manipulated and if it's possible to ever actually break free. The movie begins with the credits showing the actors playing characters in Truman's life. As they describe the lifestyle of working on The Truman Show, they have no issues with it. It's a lifestyle for them. It's a new way of living. As they repeatedly state that nothing in The Truman Show is actually fake, they say it's just controlled. As they bring up the question, is there really a difference between true reality and a manufactured reality? if you can never really tell the difference. Because everyone on the show believes that what they're doing is for the greater good. And by being manufactured, perhaps this reality is better than real reality. I mean today, more and more people think so. I mean just very recently, the K2 Institute asked a sample of 18 to 29 year olds whether they would support or oppose the government installing surveillance cameras in every household to reduce domestic violence, abuse and other illegal activity. Creating a situation exactly like The Truman Show, all while willingly actually having the awareness of the situation at hand. Choosing to deliberately adopt a Truman Show lifestyle, a lifestyle where everything you do privately, every conversation, every action, every shower, every time you go to the toilet, every time you cook, is all being watched by the government. Every intimate situation, every friend, every moment always being watched. Would you want this lifestyle? Well, the survey found out that one in three people actually did which is a horrifically large amount of people who admitted that they would actually favour the government watching everything they do inside of their own house rather than just being left alone. And this surveillance would be then used to police social media and enforce conformity to certain narratives, with AI being used to monitor for certain movements, patterns of behaviour, or keywords that could trigger an alert. Which sounds all too familiar to our current world today. I mean, if people are willing to comply with this, then perhaps it's not so crazy to think that people would willingly choose to live in The Truman Show. And by understanding this, we can understand the rest of the movie. The film continues with a monologue by Christoph, who outlines the central premise of the movie. Truman, the protagonist, is an unsuspecting lead of a reality TV show that revolves around his life. Truman, an orphan since birth, has been raised to believe that he is an ordinary individual residing in the picturesque town of Sea Haven Island. However, the reality is, this world is completely false. Every person in his life, including his mother, best friend and wife, are all just paid actors. Sea Haven Island is also fake. In actuality, it's a vast set enclosed with a gigantic dome. And it's this arrangement that provides Christoph, the director of The Truman Show, with total control over Truman's life and environment. This control extends from manipulating the weather to the day-night cycle, and even the positioning of the stars in the sky. Truman's every movement is broadcast globally, with additional funding for the show being derived from product placements. At the start of the film, Truman then leaves his house, where we the viewer secretly witness a camera that is hidden in Truman's bathroom mirror. And as we watch him, Truman is just going to work, having another regular day as he's watched by an audience. He greets his neighbours, makes coffee, and gets into his car. However, just before he drives off, a stage light falls from the sky, landing on the road outside of his house. Truman then inspects the light, noticing it's labelled Sirius, referring to the brightest star in the night sky. He's confused, but he doesn't really think about this too much. I mean, the thought of him being in a TV show is just so far from his mind that how could you possibly even imagine that you're living in a reality TV show based around your life? This thought would just never come up, and so this just seems like a mild coincidence. On his drive to work, the radio then begins telling a new story about debris from a plane falling from the sky, an attempt to rationalise this fallen light. The radio then discusses the dangers of flying, marking one of the first subtle subconscious manipulation attempts by Christoph. An aircraft in trouble began shedding parts as it flew over Sea Haven just a few moments ago. You think of it flying somewhere? Nope. No, oh, good. All to brainwash Truman into having a fear of flying and discourage him from leaving the island. And this subtle manipulation persists throughout the film. For instance, when Truman finally gets to work, Truman's boss mentions a task that would necessitate a boat trip to intentionally trigger Truman's aquaphobia. And by forcing him to go to the water and forcing him to see a sunken boat at the dock at the bay, this then further reinforces his fear subconsciously. This way he'll never want to get in a boat, as being face to face with his greatest fears is keeping this potential danger strong in his mind. 
And the fact that Truman can't overcome this manufactured fear mongering means that he's always kept weak and controlled. And this is exactly what happens today in our own world, where we are constantly bombarded with fear to control what you do. One of the most common examples of this comes from the world's most influential people telling us that the world is going to end just around the corner if you don't pay more taxes and reduce your quality of living. We will raise Canada's price on carbon pollution, rising by $15 a tonne starting in 2023 and rising to $170 Canadian dollars per tonne by 2030. People like Greta Thunberg, who has repeatedly warned and even tweeted in 2018, quote, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. And humanity really hasn't been wiped out. And this isn't just a one-off. This constant fear is always drilled into us, that humans are going to be extinct in just a few years, unless you give the government more power, more control, and reduce your quality of life even more. And when these predictions are proven false, they will always say another date again and again Again. And if you don't believe me, The Guardian for example claimed that European cities would be submerged and Britain would have a Siberian climate by 2020. And of course, this was complete BS. Establishment leaders like Al Gore claimed Arctic summer ice would be gone in 5 years in 2009. And the Arctic ice cap is actually thicker and growing. We'll go back a few decades and the elite claimed that there would be global cooling instead, when now it seems like we're in global warming. Ocasio-Cortez recently claimed that the world would end in 12 years if climate change was not addressed. And yet, if you look at this pattern of predictions, it seems like this deadline will simply be extended again, perpetuating the cycle of alarmist predictions. All while the elite fly around in private jets constantly, emitting tons of CO2 with their extravagant luxurious lifestyle, all being fueled by fossil fuels while they lecture you, to pay more carbon tax and pay higher bills. The movie then transitions to Truman confiding with his best friend, a deep-seated desire to break free from the confines of Sea Haven Island and all of the madness around him, and instead to venture off to Fiji, a place that symbolizes freedom and adventure for him. And as Truman grapples with his yearning for change, he is haunted by flashbacks of a tragic incident from his past, the death of his father in a boating accident. This event, which was orchestrated to instill a fill of water and keep Truman on the island, continues to cast a shadow over his entire life. But in a shocking twist, Truman encounters his supposedly deceased his father on the streets of Sea Haven. The sight of his father, alive and well, leaves Truman stunned. However, before he can approach his father and finally see the truth, his father is then swiftly whisked away on a bus under the guise of a homelessness cleanup operation. But it's this encounter that serves as a catalyst for Truman questioning his entire world. And this is when Truman's life changes forever. Because it's in this moment that he begins to realize that every aspect of his daily life is crafted with a hidden agenda. The television programs he watches echo the same narrative. The media headlines consistently endorse the beliefs they want Truman to adopt. Even the people that Truman interacts with on the daily repeat the same scripted lines and positive affirmations. Propaganda from Christoph permeates deep inside the society, much like its pervasive presence in our own society. Because just like Truman, we are constantly inundated with propaganda designed to keep us blissfully ignorant of the reality around us. I mean, everywhere nowadays, we see madness plaguing our entire society. Just recently, a school in England was in controversy for an interaction between two students and a teacher after an insane, aggressively demented lecture from the teacher with the two 13 year old girls. Saying things like, should be in an asylum. Why are they saying that? Actually, if they want to identify as a cow or something, then they're like genuinely unwell. And then... What was this lecture about? It was about the two girls not accepting that their classmate was actually a house cat. And because these girls wouldn't accept that their classmate was a cat, the teacher exploded in rage, calling these students despicable for not believing their classmate is a cat. The teacher had branded a 13 year old girl despicable because she refused to accept that a classmate identified as a cat. This insane nonsense isn't just in schools, it's now in every corner of society. And if you don't like it, you'll be banished from all culture institutions, social platforms, and just society as a whole. In some cases, you'll even get your banks cancelling you. Seeking answers and reassurance, Truman then turns to his mother. However, she dismisses his concerns, suggesting that he hallucinated the entire counter with his father, all to perpetuate the lie that has been Truman's entire life. Soon after, we transition into Truman's past, where the movie reveals his first encounter with Lauren, a woman who would leave a lasting impact on his life. A first that eyes meet across college, sparking a connection filled with longing and desire. The film then transitions to a dance, where Truman is dancing with his horrible wife, where he then spots Lauren in the crowd. Their eyes meet again, and they share a moment of intense connection, only then for Lauren to be forcibly removed by men in suits. And this scene underscores the artificiality of Truman's relationship with his wife, revealing it to be a mere construct of the show, whereas his true love is a hindrance to Kristoff. 
The next scene then goes to a library at the college, where Truman spots Lauren's hand adorned with a pin that reads, how is it going to end? Suggesting that Lauren has actually infiltrated the set in a bold act of defiance against the show's message. Because Lauren is a beacon of truth in this world, but her attempts to reveal the truth are always silenced and suppressed, as her voice is repressed constantly, any sign of protest is crushed, and Truman has no idea what's happening. And then as we see Truman trying to recreate Lauren's face, it's clear that the only purpose in Truman's life is to find her, to find the truth, and escape this artificial world that he lives in. And all while this is happening, people across society in the real world are watching Truman's life eagerly. And as disgusting and dark as this may seem, many of us don't realise that in many ways, we have multiple versions of the Truman Show happening simultaneously, and a real life version of the actual Truman Show could be created sooner than you think. You see, with the world of content at our fingertips, and the ability to instantaneously demand exactly what we want, exactly when we want it, one desire remains constant across the board. People want to see a representation of the human experience that is authentic. And whilst this desire to be a voyeur of the authentic has existed existed for as long as entertainment itself, the bar for what is considered truly authentic has constantly been raised. For a long period, reality TV quenched its thirst for genuine characters and stories. We watched shows like Survivor and The Bachelor that showed us how real people handle extreme, albeit planned, situations. Shows like The Kardashians took this a step further by giving us a glimpse into how real people handle the struggles of their own lives, no matter how mundane and ridiculous. But as social media grew, access to all of these seemingly mundane moments in other people's lives grew with it, and despite similar content being deemed too dull or too raw by television studios in the past, online audiences were proving them wrong, turning vloggers and lifestyle influencers into overnight stars for just recording and posting their everyday lives. Because the best entertainment has always been about providing a universal story or just another human being that we can latch onto, and what better than using actual real life characters for maximum satisfaction. And this is why every day we're seeing more and more online creators pushing this concept to its limits. I mean at the moment, you can right now log into Twitch and watch someone else eat, drive, work, socialise and even sleep. Every everything constantly in real time, and these people do it willingly. So where do we go from here? The truth is, there's a massive flaw to all of this. The subjects of these videos are always aware that they're on camera, so how can someone be who they really are when they know that they're always being of course they can't. And so this creates a demand for something like The Truman Show. And the truth is that media companies like Amazon have already started experimenting with smaller scale versions of this format. I mean, just earlier this year, Amazon Studios released their series Jury Duty, which stars Ronald Gladden, a non-actor who thought he was volunteering to be a juror on a real case. But unbeknownst to Gladden, nothing in this court case was real. The case was made up. The judge, his fellow jurors, the defendant, the attorneys, the courthouse security, and every single person he interacted with over the course of the 17 day trial were all comedic actors, and during that period, Gladden made friendships that he thought were actually real, making decisions that he thought would change people's lives forever. But it was finally revealed to him that the cameras he thought were there to capture footage for a documentary were there simply to let us all in on the joke that he was unknowingly the subject of. And while the compensation of $100,000 was there to soften the blow, this seemed to make this whole thing appear much less sinister than it sounds, and its overwhelming success with audiences and critics set a precedent that really wasn't there before, because jury duty isn't a major media company's first attempt at the Truman Show format, it's just the first one that resonated with audiences. But even more creepy is that in the early 2000s, Channel 4 attempted two similar shows, Bed Sitcom, where three non-actors from the public were moved into a stage flat, with three actors posing as flatmates, and the far more elaborate and expensive one, Space Cadets, where nine real people were asked to quit their jobs to train for a month and participate in what they thought was an actual mission to space. Both shows received a mixed reception, and were criticised for being manipulative, and for being psychologically damaging for their involuntary participants. One of the actors in Space Cadets, Charlie Skelton, even spoke about the effect the show had on him despite knowing beforehand that the whole thing was a hoax. He said, quote, for about a month, after the end of the show, I thought I was on camera all the time. I would wake up at night and think there were cameras in the corner of the room. It was quite disturbing. And so just imagine the effects the experience had on the non-actors. And Ronald Gladden, the subject of Jury Duty, also expressed something similar. However, the discourse surrounding Amazon's Jury Duty now, nearly 20 years later, isn't nearly anywhere near as controversial. In fact, it's overwhelmingly positive. The series has even been nominated for multiple Academy Awards. So now that the world has told them we're ready, it's almost a certainty that Amazon and rival streaming companies will continue to try and replicate and expand upon the success of this Truman-esque format. But when companies with endless resources like Amazon, Disney and Apple are all encouraged to push the boundaries of a format like this and turn up the dial in pursuing a way to capitalise the ever-growing demand for the ultimate authentic character study, it seems that all roads lead to us being glued to a screen, watching a person who has the misfortunate fate of being the real Truman Burbank.
As Truman reflects on his past, it becomes evident that he still yearns for Lauren. He even recreates her image using fashion magazines, as Lauren represents the only authentic thing in his fake empty world. And it's revealed in the film that Truman's fixation on Fiji stems from the fact that Lauren was now supposedly living there. And as Truman plans his move to Fiji, he then begins to notice more and more of the absurdity of the society that he lives in, notably when his radio seems to malfunction, providing a detailed commentary on his every action. Okay, he's making his turn on the Lancaster Square. It's in this moment that Truman knows he has to escape this fake and mad society that he lives in. And so Truman visits a travel agency to purchase a ticket to Fiji. And this scene is filled with subtle hints designed to dissuade him from traveling. Posters warning about disease and terrorism abroad, and an image of a plane being struck by lightning, all serving as little nudges to control his actions into the right direction. And this concept of subtly guiding individuals towards behaviours that align with the state's ideals is something that we're seeing in our own world today. In fact, this sort of thing comes directly from the burgeoning field of behavioural economics. Now, behavioural economics relies on the premise that most people are irrational, often making choices that are not in their best interests. And consequently, to optimise the potential of a population, a government may need to still the population towards making the right decisions. And in the UK, this is done by a government unit called the Nudge Unit, a government entity dedicated to implementing behavioural economics on its population. Now initially the Nudge Unit had relatively benign beginnings, being used to promote small things like loft insulation by offering subsidised clean-out services for people's clutter. And this simple intervention by the government resulted in a five-fold increase in loft insulation uptake, leading to significant energy savings, which was great for everyone. However, as the Nudge Unit became more more successful, the focus soon shifted towards more controversial objectives. With the UK government leveraging the growing surveillance state and its growing data collection capabilities, they began to personalise threats in car tax reminders, even including photos of the cars in the letters, akin to a kidnapper sending a photo of their captive with a ransom demand. And this approach was found to triple the effectiveness of the letters. But still, this is fairly innocuous. However, the Nudge Unit then attempted to influence not just behaviours, but people's actual beliefs, as they quickly realised that people were resistant to direct government messaging, and so their solution was to use third parties and downplay direct government involvement in marketing campaigns. This strategy was outlined in Mindspace, the UK government's 2010 manifesto on influencing people's behaviour. Because don't just take this from me, here's the Nudge Unit's view on this. Someone who has developed a dislike of government interventions may be less likely to listen to messages that they perceive to come from the government. In such cases, the most effective strategy for changing behaviour may be to use third parties or downplay government involvement in a campaign or intervention. And so it was around this time after the quote that the UK government used the nudge unit to influence TV shows and social media, partnering with companies like Sky, Meta, Indeed, Bloomberg, Santander and so many more. And this gave the nudge unit unprecedented access to the entirety of the media that you consume. And by controlling the media, they would then be able to control the ideas that the population formed about the world. And so what were they doing with this control? Well, of course, they were pushing the government's narrative. For example, the Nudge Unit often pushes for characters in TV shows to be more environmentally conscious so that they can make government messages more digestible, as the characters are now the one influencing the population, not just being direct government messages. Which is why this is especially prevalent in kids' TV, as kids are so much easier to influence, and kids can then influence the parents. And so once you notice this, it gets so much easier to spot. I mean, just take a look at this scene from the soap opera Coronation Street, where one character brings up his suspicion about the government, and the other two people in the conversation immediately shut it down as ridiculous. They don't want you to know. The media, banks, big business, they're all in it together, a secret global cabal. Then in a later scene, they discuss that his suspicions about the government and banks are actually a form of anti-Semitism. Griff's secret cabal owning the media and banks is also a classic anti-Semitic trope. But then the Nudge Unit finally used social media platforms, as the government found out that this was the most effective tool for controlling the population. And so the Nudge Unit has been leveraging data collected by Meta and other companies to deliver targeted nudges. For instance, they utilised Amazon's data to identify individuals who had purchased candles and matches. These individuals were then sent voice messages via their Alexa devices, informing them about fire safety precautions. And whilst this is a small example, it gets so much deeper. I mean, just look at how the government influenced social media companies to ban all information about the Hunter Biden laptop story, all during the 2020 election. It was admitted by Elon Musk and even Mark Zuckerberg that government intelligence agencies, just like the Nudge Units, were trying to influence the algorithms of these social media sites for political gain. The FBI, I think, basically came to us, some, some folks on our team, and was like, hey, um, 
just so you know, like you should be on high alert. There was the, we we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. And if this involves censoring stories like the Hunter Biden laptop story, so be it. Because the nudge unit has been adopted by almost all governments worldwide to control the actions and nudge the behavior of all individuals within society, striking fear into anyone who dares do anything the government doesn't like. And so it's in this moment that Truman begins to notice all of this. And as a result, Truman is now actively challenging his delusion, which is his first concrete step towards freedom. Despite Kristoff's totalitarian control, he's unable to stop Truman's intuition. The draw of truth for those who catch a glimpse is incredible strong. And this is true for the real world as well. Once you've woken up to the truth, you can never go back to sleep. And Truman will discover exactly this. Because no matter how painful his new course is, he will never deviate from always wanting the truth, even if it comes at the cost of the seemingly perfect society that he lives in. And now he's starting to see the lies that Kristoff uses for what they really are. But no matter the emergency and situation that Kristoff throws at him, Truman now knows it's all contrived. And with Truman's eyes opened, everything he does has one goal, seeing how far down the rabbit hole he can really go. So at home, Truman waits in his car for his wife to return from work. Upon her arrival, he draws her attention to the predicament patterns of the passerbys on the street. Her dismissive response to his observations leaves him unsatisfied, prompting him to impulsively take Meryl on an unplanned road trip. Almost immediately, a traffic jam halts their progress. Truman then feigns a return home, effectively clearing the traffic, only to pivot around and steer his way out of the suburbs and onto the open road, where they eventually reach a bridge, the final barrier between Truman and the mainland. And this is where Truman is once again confronted with his deep subconscious fear of water. It's the final hurdle to derail his escape, and yet Truman conquers his fear by shutting his eyes, compelling Merrill to guide the car as he maintains the pressure on the accelerator. Once they cross the bridge, Christoph orchestrates further hurdles to prevent Truman's departure. Truman seemingly navigates through a staged wildfire, but is then halted by a roadblock, conveniently placed due to a supposed leak at a nearby power plant. In a desperate attempt, Truman then tries to proceed on foot, but is intercepted and restrained by individuals in hazmat suits who escort him back home. The absurdity of all of these events solidifies Truman's doubts about the authenticity of his own world. And that's why once he gets back home, Truman now feels trapped, akin to a caged animal. His wife, failing to suit the situation, offers him coffee with a blatant product placement. All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. Truman then quickly picks up on her performative behavior and directly confronts her. The actress playing Truman's wife starts to panic, quickly breaking character and using kitchen utensils to make Truman back off. And as the situation spirals into chaos, Truman's wife almost reveals her acted role. Do something! asking Kristoff and the team to help her out. And as the situation escalates, suddenly Truman's lifelong friend Marlon intervenes at the very last moment, whisking Truman away for a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But at this point, Marlon is just akin to applying a band-aid to a gaping wound. The dam has burst, and Truman's belief that the society he lives in is real is completely dead. Which leads to one of the most poignant scenes of the film, when Truman is seated at the end of the pier, confiding with his best friend, the person that he seemingly trusts the most. As they reminisce about their shared past together, we see the showrunners feeding his friend lines, including a promise that he would never lie to Truman. And the last thing that I would ever do is lie to you even though he's lied to him his entire life. The entire friendship is just scripted, because Truman's friend is just another pawn in this wider system. The friend never had any real values, he never had any real beliefs, he hadn't found himself, he was simply an actor in this fake world, and all he wants is to maintain this illusion for as long as possible. But Truman doesn't, meaning their friendship can never last. And that's when the film shifts to an interview with the show's creator, during which they take calls from viewers. One of these calls is from Lauren, who accuses the creator of being a liar and a manipulator. However, he uses this this as an opportunity to justify his actions, arguing that he has provided Truman with the chance to lead a normal life. He insists that if Truman truly wanted to leave, he could, but that Truman prefers his familiar surroundings. And it's this statement by Kristoff that encapsulates the essence of the movie, the illusion of freedom that we live in today. We feel free when the government watches our every movement, every text and conversation. We feel protected from the badness of the world. We feel free with our new technology addiction. We can look at everything, anywhere, all the time, constantly, with all the information we've ever wanted, giving us unlimited freedom, or whilst being chained to the objects giving us this freedom. We feel that our opinions are made by ourselves, free to any opinion we like, any opinion chosen from the choices given to us by controlled TV shows, 
puppet social media influencers and constantly listening technology in our pockets. We want this supposed freedom because the fear that's been instilled into us for thinking anything else is far too horrifying to accept. And this controlled illusion of freedom makes you a good citizen, a good taxpayer, a good servant. Too numb to ever realize that you gave up your God-given freedom to the least among us. All for the empty freedom we slave our entire lives for. And now with the growing industry of augmented and virtual reality, we are witnessing this Trumanesque reality manifest itself today. Just recently, Apple revealed its most innovative and groundbreaking technology yet, the Apple Vision Pro. And major corporations like Disney have partnered up with Apple, firmly believing that this will be the VR headset that finally brings virtual reality to the mainstream. Disney CEO Bob Iger has actually been quoted saying, we believe the Apple Vision Pro is a revolutionary platform that can make our vision a reality. And so more and more, we'll soak up the more real, immersive and captivating shows like Jury Duty. We're going to be watching these shows in real life. And in addition to this, we'll be addicted more and more to the parasocial relationships being fed to us every day in the virtual world, living our entire lives through other people's stories in the virtual reality. With this new growing technological industry aiming to completely decimate the last few moments between the urge to indulge in a distraction and the subsequent dopamine reward, thrusting the digital Truman Show world of distractions directly into your eyeballs. And whether it's Apple's Vision Pro or Meta's Metaverse, this technology is expected to take over the world this decade. And so by the point that you're watching this stuff in virtual reality, you'll most likely be wired into the virtual world, as all of your friends, community, religious groups, celebrities, businesses, and shops will all be operating within it, creating an entirely new society and it will make you feel incredible. You'll jump into this virtual society every day, go to work in this virtual society, meet friends in the virtual society, watch TV in this virtual society, party in the virtual world and find love in this virtual society. You'll never want to leave. You can be what you want, when you want and do what you want, repeating this cycle every single day of the week, meaning that you'll never have to use your imagination again. You'll never have to think for yourself because all of this is done for you in the virtual reality. All the thoughts you have, all the opinions you hold that don't conform to the party line will gleefully be scrubbed from your consciousness, with all of this putting you under a massive illusion. Because only when you take off the headset and look around, do you truly realize you're just another Truman Burbank, living in your control reality where nothing is real, everything is manufactured, and every person you speak to is being completely controlled, all for the benefit of a select few controllers looking down from the sky. I mean, one of the most anticipated features of the Apple Vision Pro is its extraordinary eye tracking capability. The headset will use a series of highly sophisticated cameras to use eye movements as a primary navigation tool for the entire interface. And by analyzing this data with AI to see how you perceive and view advertisements and content, Big Tech will have ever more control to predict your next desire, determining precisely how long each item they show you holds your attention for and what distracts you the most. And this will work in conjunction with the real world web, meaning that your every desire will literally be within your reach permanently, thus making your reality seem more and more perfect or whilst being more and more controlled, meaning the government won't ever actually need to put cameras on you 24 7 because you're already willingly choosing to do so under the illusion of your supposed freedom just like the truman show after this interview in the truman show we see truman return to his routine mirroring the beginning of the movie however at the end of the day truman falls asleep in the basement and subsequently goes missing and this is when everyone realizes he has escaped Christoph then orders all of the actors to search for Truman and for the first time in the show's history, interrupts the actual broadcast. But despite the collective effort of the actors scouring nearly the entire set, Truman remains elusive, driven to desperation. Christoph prematurely illuminates the set into daylight mode and, acting on a hunch, instructs the team to scan the cameras near the harbor and on the boat. After cycling through several cameras, finally locate Truman aboard a sailboat, prompting Christoph to resume the broadcast. After a few moments of peaceful sailing, Christoph grappling with the dilemma of risking Truman discovering the truth or ensuring Truman's safety, decides to unleash a violent storm on Truman's boat. He will not let Truman ruin the show. And despite escalating the severity of the weather, Truman remains undeterred, defiantly shouting to the sky. Is that the best you can do? You're gonna have to kill me! Caught in a godlike frenzy, Christoph then intensifies the storm to its maximum, much to the dismay of his crew and producer. Truman, however, perseveres, but is eventually knocked unconscious. And at the very last moment, Christoph then withdraws the weather, restoring the calm waters. Upon regaining consciousness, Truman resumes his sailing. He has conquered the storm and the sea seems to favor him. But that's when reality shifts, and the bow of Truman's boat pierces the side of the set, creating a gaping hole in the sky dome. And this is when Truman's suspicions are completely confirmed. And in a state of panic and euphoria,
Victoria, he starts punching the wall. His whole reality was a lie and he knew it deep down. And the full reality of Truman's situation begins to dawn on him as he spots a ramp at the end of the water. Truman then walks across this ramp, symbolically walking on water. Truman then finds a staircase and slowly ascends to the side of the set. At the top of the stairs, he then finds a door labelled exit and opens it, revealing the darkness beyond his world, the truth that lies ahead. And in a godlike voice from the sky, Kristoff halts Truman's exit, revealing to Truman that he has been the star of a TV show watched by the entire world. Truman asks, Was nothing real? Christoph then responds that Truman is real, and that's what made him so captivating for millions. Christoph then attempts to dissuade Truman from leaving the set by suggesting that there is no more truth in the real world, and in Truman's little perfect world, he's free of fear and all the stresses of real life. Like a father, Christoph justifies his actions and recounts all of Truman's most intimate moments, but Truman decides that the truth is far more important than the illusion as he walks through the exit. And one of the most depressingly accurate parts of all of this is that the viewers who are addicted to watching Truman's entire life then just switch over the channel and continue in their daily boring life, mostly apathetic to everything they just witnessed. Five seconds of dopamine, then switching to the next TV show. Just any other distraction they can find to pass the dullness of their existence. Just another swipe, another dopamine sucking noise. Highlighting the exact process that happens with the next Jury Duty or the next Truman Show, where we watch it in the future with our virtual goggles and our own little virtual reality, constantly watching, never understanding. But what's key to understand with this entire movie is that Truman's overwhelming urge to reconnect with what is authentic, with what is genuinely experienced, is just too powerful to ignore. His desire to understand the true nature of reality is strong enough to dismantle the entire fabricated society that he's been living in. When Truman leaves the dome, he is reclaiming control, turning his back on the sterile and hollow existence that he was trapped in his entire life. And it's Truman's quest for knowledge that enabled him to conquer his fear of the water and achieve his objective of escaping the island. It was the last thing holding him back, as he doubted everything else on the set apart from his fear of the water. But once he broke through these doubts, Truman sailed out to sea. And all the while he's out to sea, Truman is longing for this all to be in his head. He wants to know that he'll reach the shore and explore the rest of the world. He he hopes he's mistaken, but he still wants to uncover the actual truth. Even though this truth may destroy his life and completely change the view of the world around him, but the truth is still more important than anything. And today we find ourselves in a similar process. The increasing absurdity and madness of our society is beginning to fracture in its core. As our world, economy and culture starts to crumble, we are witnessing the rejection of this worn out system. We're observing new generations of younger individuals opting out of the workforce, rejecting the cultural drivel forced upon us all. And that's why now we stand at a crossroad, where we are presented with a new path. A path of metaverses, Apple Vision Pros, virtual AI reality that could lead us away from the current world. A path that leads us to a more fabricated society, a more fake, a more hollow, a more controlled reality. Alternatively, we could choose a return to what is genuinely experienced, to something more authentic. But whichever path we choose, our faith in society is disintegrating. The crack are becoming invisible in our own reality. The game is imploding. The question is, where do we go from here? While well, Plato claimed that true reality is hidden, that we are force-fed certain narratives and ideas of the world to keep us in the darkness. In his allegory of the cave, three men are chained inside of the cave. Behind them is a wall and a fire that illuminates the area in front of them. Back and forth, people and animals walk behind the men in front of the fire, casting shadows. The men inside the cave describe the shadows on the wall as real passing on these ideas to one another as their culture. However, one day one of the men is able to escape and immediately leaves the cave. And it's here that he sees the sun for the first time. He sees the truth of what reality actually is. There are real, tangible animals and creatures that inhabit the world, illuminated by the much brighter light of the sun. The man experiences truth. So then he returns to the cave to try to explain what he saw and what reality really is for those who are still chained to this false reality. But by breaking the cultural values of the cave, his connections to the old world are severed. He can never go back to the police of the cave. And for Truman, this was when he didn't act according to the social norms within his TV show. And do you want to live by the social norms of your current cultural madness? Is this the life you want to live? Well, for many of us, we're starting to reject all of this. As we enter the age of Western civilization collapsing, with government control growing, and people becoming more atomized, depressed, and lonely than ever, we're seeing antibodies being produced to overcome the societal disease. We're seeing more and more people rejecting the values of our twisted society. The pendulum is swinging towards individualism. The question is, will we overcome the obstacles of fear that lay on our path? path.
Ever wondered why you have no purpose? Why none of your friends have any motivation? Why our generation has lost all passion for life? This isn't an accident. It's all part of a process called the swamping effect. You see, when the average short attention span person is flooded with a daily stream of endless information, people slide into a passively numbed mental state. And when this happens, you become easily fooled into believing anything you're told. It's why there's no soul or passion or authenticity left in our culture. And it's why our society is dying. But there is a solution to this. And many of the other problems play plaguing you living in our current culture. And I'm not just talking about modern day BS solutions, I'm talking about a new form of community, a way for us to take back control of our lives. With my new newsletter, I will go deep into the real solutions and answers, the value systems of thousands of philosophers condensed into an easy to understand package to help you improve your life, all at no cost to you. And if you're interested in this, where I go into far more depth about the solutions to the problems we discuss, just click the link in the description below. We've already published multiple essays so far, and there's so many more to come in the near future. So if you're interested, sign up for free by clicking the link here.